Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. This is episode number 759, if I'm not mistaken. And I might be, sometimes I am. But my name is Camden Busey. I'm in Libertyville, Illinois, at uh, Reformed Forum's headquarters in the new studio. And I have with me uh, Dr. Carlton Wynn, who is Associate Pastor at Westminster PCA in Atlanta, Georgia, as well as Adjunct Professor of Systematic Theology at RTS Atlanta. Welcome back, Carlton. It's good to see you. Good to speak with you again. Thank you, Camden. Feels kind of weird not having uh, Blaine with us, yeah, but no. we'll, we'll have to manage. Certainly. And uh, we're looking to try to schedule another Van Til group, if people are wondering. Uh, that is definitely in the mix, and um, we just need to get to it. It's not that uh, we're unwilling to do those episodes uh, more frequently. It's just often... Uh, Carlton's a pastor, Lane's a pastor, uh, and, and then uh, all three of us have a bunch of things we're doing on the side. <laughs> so like, yeah. sometimes it just uh, takes some time to get things scheduled out and uh, in the mix. But they're on the way. Along with the Van Til Group, we're working through, uh, in, or along with Voss Group, in Van Til Group, we're working through uh, defense of the faith uh, slowly, but it's been really solid. It's great to revisit that. Today we're going to be speaking about uh, another new book, a different book, uh, titled Theology for Ministry, How Doctrine Affects Pastoral Life and Practice. And Carlton has a chapter in this book. This book has been edited by Rob Edwards, uh, John Ferguson, and our good friend Chad Van Dixorn. It's a fest shrift to uh, Sinclair Ferguson, and it's published by PNR Publishing. Uh, several copies of it were given away, I think, at T4G. And I've heard also the Shepherds Conference. And uh, for those of you who do not have a copy, we will we are accepting pre-orders right now. If you head on over to reformedforum.org slash store, uh, we'll have pre-orders available. We are, uh, let's see here in my notes, offering it for $29.99. That's a savings of 25%. So we'll get that shipped out to you, free shipping in the U.S. as soon as it arrives to us. And I hear it's either August 2nd or August 3rd is the, the release date. So if you'd like a copy while, while supplies last, uh, we've got pre-orders available right now in the store. Along with that, I've got a book on Carl Rahner. Finally, that book is back in stock. I think it's in stock in our store for the very first time. So if you're interested in that, we've got a good sale on that as well. $14.99. And I'm debating starting a reading group on that. So if somebody would like to uh, join in and in a smaller group, maybe we'll meet once a week or once every other week on Zoom uh, to work through that book and talk about modern Roman Catholicism and how Rahner fits into that and how Rahner compares and contrasts with confessional reform theology, for example, and what we've been calling the deeper Protestant conception. Uh, certainly, uh, that might be of interest to you. So let me know if that's the case. Head on over to our website or Send me a note uh, at Camden Busey on Twitter or uh, at Reformed Forum or mail at reformedforum.org email address. So Carlton, um, we've got you lined up here. We're speaking about uh, you. You've got pride of place. So after the editors have done all their front matter and introductions, bios and all that kind of stuff, we've got boom, Carlton Wynn right up front on this book. Hey, man, with the it's, chat. Not, <laughs> it's not because of my name. It's only because of the topic. Well, isn't this the great place to be on? Stand on the foundation of God's word. So the 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 chapter is scripture, foundational for life and ministry. I love this chapter. I'm looking forward to talking to several of the contributors for this book. Let me just before we get into your chapter, Carlton. Um, we've got. Uh, I'm I'm not listing all. This is probably not even half of the contributors. But we have Cornell Venema, who's president down at Mid America Reform Seminary. Uh, Ian Hamilton, Lane Tipton, who's got a spectacular, wonderful article in there, The Doctrine of Christ. Phil Riken, Dennis Johnson, Ligon Duncan, Joel Beakey, David Strain, Bob Godfrey, Craig Troxell, you name it. There's many, many more. So this is a, this is a hefty book and an important one, and I think it goes to show um, just the impact that Sinclair Ferguson has had on so many different people that he would uh, com- warrant a, a festrift of such such magnitude. So get a copy of the book if you don't have it. If you don't like two or three of the chapters, so what? There's like 75 other ones that are that are worthwhile. And uh, they all have a particular character to it. And that's where I wanted to start with you, Carlton, because uh, the title for this book, I think, is rather apt. And a lot of times, Festrifts, I'm not high on Festrifts. Um, this one is good, really good. But generally speaking, a fest shrift can be thrown together and, and uh, the editors might just ask a bunch of people, their friends, and maybe some people loosely connected with the person they're seeking to honor. And there isn't a direction 
uh, or, or a real, I don't know, common thread that goes through all the works. And often a festrift that gets thrown together, it's just typically guys willing to contribute, but they basically just contribute whatever they had on their hard drive or whatever they happen to be working on rather than writing something that was specifically tailored to this celebratory writing, a fest shrift. And I think here in this book, with its title, Theology for Ministry, the editors have really accomplished something significant in writing a significant book where in the chapters, um, at least all of the ones that I have read, I haven't finished every one, but where they're all working towards a uh, a real legitimate and substantial connection between doctrine and pastoral ministry. And that's a difficult thing to do. And I see that certainly in your book, but I wanted to start before we maybe even get into that, ask you Carlton about your, when you were first introduced to Sinclair Ferguson, not maybe the man first, but uh, at least the ministry and some of his writings. How did you encounter Ferguson? And and then eventually how were you led to write a chapter in this festrift? Well, thank you, Camden. It's it's a bit difficult to answer that question uh, because I really can't claim a deep friendship with with Dr. Ferguson at all. I've never had him as a professor, um, and yet I would say, along with, I mean, I know I'm speaking for many here, but as I've grown up in the Reformed world, um, aside from R.C. Sproul, I would say Sinclair Ferguson has been an unofficial teacher of mine for so many years, so many others. Um, you know, when I'm driving Sunday morning to church, sometimes I will throw on an Alistair Bag sermon or a Sinclair Ferguson sermon yeah. just to get the juices going. And, mm-hmm. and uh, Dr. Ferguson's work on union with Christ and all the things we've come to know and love from Dr. Gaffin filtered through oftentimes Dr. Ferguson has just been a boon for me spiritually. And I, I remember hearing that, you know, back at, at Westminster when both Ferguson and Gaffin were teaching there, uh, Ferguson would say uh, in his quieter moments, you know, students come for Ferguson, but they stay for Gaffin. <laughs> but I, but I know, I know that there are so many around the world uh, through his many years of service, who have just been blessed enormously by his wide-ranging ministry in a variety of contexts, through his books, uh, certainly in the various Christian institutions in which he's taught. And I would say for me, it's it's come just listening to his sermons and um, and reading his books. And then during the years at Westminster, I began to have a little bit more of a personal connection with him as he would come in and, and teach occasionally and um, especially there at the end. And I um, was very thankful for the tangential connections that I had with him through other pastors in the PCA and people that knew him uh, better than I. And then really my, my entry into this volume was uh, through a request by one of the editors. Um, just thankful enormously to have the great privilege uh, to contribute and uh, had the opportunity to attend a book presentation for Dr. Ferguson and just thanked him for the privilege of, you know, um, for writing in the volume and, and really hope he's okay with that. <laughs> no turning back now, but on your point about Fess Shriften, uh, yeah. I have a dear friend who will remain nameless who said, who says that uh, there are a number of types of publications where good essays go to die. <laughs> and, <laughs> And number one on that list is, uh, you'll get a kick out of this. Number one on that list is uh, conference addresses that are formed into a book. Okay. <laughs> That's like the number one place where a good essay or good ideas go to die. Number two is in a fesh rift <laughs> because of the reasons that you've already articulated. However, this book, as you pointed out, has an integrated systematic theology type organization that makes it more than than a fest shrift and it's designed to be you know marching through the main loci of of the theological corpus and and really trying to intentionally connect that to the practice and life of pastoral ministry and each author i think brings his own stamp his own personality his own interest to that but at least there's an attempt to ground these practical implications in the doctrines that we confess. So for that, I'm very thankful as well. Yeah, no doubt. 
you know, Festriff, uh, I, I appreciate the point. Uh, perhaps the most unique Festriff that I've ever read is Jerusalem and Athens, which yeah. is a Festriff for Van Til. I don't know if that is a typical practice, if that format is perhaps an older practice or if it's relatively unique. I, I don't know. I don't know the history of of Festriften. But, um, Do what you is, want to tell our listeners what makes Jerusalem and Athens? Well, yeah, so. that's what I mean. It's, it's uh, not only were there <laughs> critical essays where they invited a whole host of people who were criticizing Van Til, which is unusual. Because yeah. usually the Festrift is, you know, kind of like, uh, you know, celebrating someone. And there are some like that. But even the friendlier ones still are criticizing Van Til for various things. And then Van Til wrote responses to each of them yeah. that are included in the Festrift with, and, and its thoughtful interaction. So it's really almost a, I don't know if I'd quite say it's a magnum opus, but it's, it's a yeah, spectacular it book. Yes, that's uh, one copy of it. I got a couple different versions of it laying around, but um, there are uh, it it puts on display Van Til's thought life and his theology as a whole, and then you get this wonderful bonus of him interacting with it. And that took him away yeah. from other academic work for about a year, I think, when we were when I'm reading through the letters and other projects he could have done. This was flung upon him, but I think we're better for it in the long run to see him interact with some of his most major critics, at least from within the reformed world. This book is not like that, ever, but I right. don't know any others that are really. I don't either. I just think it's hilarious that in Van Til's <laughs> Fesh Rift, he's got these critics who are just right. slamming his work and he's responding. Have you ever noticed that on the cover of this, yeah. at least in this edition, it says critical discussions on the philosophy and apologetics of Cornelius Van Til. Uh -huh. And then you open up to the title page and it says critical discussions on the theology and, uh, and apologetics of Cornelius Van Til. It's like, yeah. it's like the editors couldn't figure out whether he was a philosopher or a theologian in the subtitle of the book. But. That's true. I suspect that probably has something to do with the marketing department and the cover and the dust jacket was made later. So the original copy, um, well, all my Van Til stuff's in a different room at the moment, but uh, the original copy, I think, is a green hardback that had a dust jacket that looks like that. My okay. suspicion is the dust jacket was either redesigned or created a little bit later by a different group of people other than Guillen, uh, perhaps. It's a guess, total guess. I just know how this stuff works sometimes. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. So they yeah, thought, yeah. well, we can, we can sell more of this if we pitch it towards philosophers. Or some people yeah. picked it up and realized this is, this is like a philosophy book. This isn't just theology. And so they probably changed the title of it or the subtitle of it and then revamped the um, – the dust jacket, which you could easily just swap out dust jackets or have them printed later and put on there rather than you can't necessarily have all the books reprinted, for example, if they were already printed. Okay. Total, total speculation, but it's informed. This, this is why I'm talking to a professional. <laughs> I don't know that. I dabble. You. So later copies, like the paperbacks that we have, just look like the hardcover with the dust jacket. So I think yeah. they just perpetuate the the divergence between the front matter and the cover for that reason. But I'm guessing if we're going to do some uh, historical work, it's, there's a paper for somebody right there that you're yeah, ready made. You, you tune in to, to Christ the center, you students, uh, you know, looking for paper topics in your church history courses. There's a ready-made paper for you. Go to the, on to the Montgomery library at Westminster theological seminary, browse around, you know, the early seventies, mid seventies, when this book was written look for any, any uh, letters back and forth with uh, Guillen, the editor, and and you might catch a thread that'll let you and know then, what happened. And then do a deeper dive on the relationship between philosophy and theology and the thought of Cornelius Van Til. Yeah, but you could you could string this out, you know, to a whole life career of of something. So you got to start somewhere. Just start with why the cover's different than the front. Okay. Back. <laughs> yeah, I find it to be symbolic. I appreciate you pointing that out because I never even noticed that. So there you go. You know, on, there's something <laughs> symbolic about it because on the surface, you're thinking you're going to read about philosophy and then you right. actually get into the book. Yeah. And, and you get and into the corpus there. of Van Til and you're you realize, trained. hey, this is theology, not it philosophy. Is. Well, that's the big question. Yeah. Or uh, I, maybe I shouldn't put it so uh, in such a binary way. Right. Uh, 
it, there's a lot of you're gonna get us started. There's this we'll is another this for Van Til okay. Group, and when yeah, we yeah. get into yeah, the yeah. sciences and ski NTO okay. with with all that uh, with with Thomas, perhaps it's a it's another discussion. Right. Um, but Van Til is certainly one. I think a book on another fest shrift to Van Til, you could usually write them when the person's alive, so this wouldn't be really significant at the moment. But a, a volume devoted to Cornelius Van Til that focused on theology slash philosophy and ministry would be quite interesting mm-hmm. because he was, people assume that he is more of an ivory tower guy or that he's a thinking and writing about these obscure topics to experts all day long. But mm-hmm. for those who knew him, even his neighbors would know that he was a, a very childlike figure in terms of the way he spoke, things he was interested in. He was brilliant, but he also was utterly concerned with uh, being an evangelist. And he wasn't one of those um, caricatured apologists who's just seeking to win an argument and beat people down, but was legitimately concerned for the souls of his uh, people around him. I just read a, a letter that he wrote to Meredith Klein. It's a little bit of a um, of a leading edge thing here, uh, hot news here, news release that uh, the OPC has just received the uh, the, the historical archives of Meredith G. Klein. And so now mm-hmm. Danny Olinger, who's the president of my committee there, is working through those along with John Meather. And they've been sending me some pictures and scans mm. of various resources. But there was a letter in there from um, Van Til to Klein. So there's a bunch of letters that don't exist in the Westminster archives because Van Til wrote them and sent them. And if he hand wrote them, they weren't typed out in carbon copy those those pink duplicates that we have mm-hmm. most of the official letters that are in the Westminster archive especially in the 40s and 50s are all on these pink duplicates because he typed the letter but they were typed on carbon copy or similar technology this is this is where cc comes from on your email you millennials and gen zers but the gen zers don't even know what an email is so um anyway <laughs> We're working on that. Yeah, well, that's fascinating. We're getting into the client. weeds here, but he. The, that's the, great. The point was, he went to an event uh, on secularism and secularization. I think he was with Paul Woolley, and they were at this like lunch event, and the guy gave a presentation, and it was just completely devoid of the gospel. And he said that you know what people need most is what Van Til says, what Machen used to call animal comforts. You know, uh, basically just food, shelter, water, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs kind of stuff. Mm. And uh, he said he was just so disturbed by this that there was they were at an ostensibly Christian or theological event and there was no gospel. And then he got up and uh, toward the end of it asked a question slash gave a speech about the need for the gospel. But he said that he made some blunder initially where he, he uh, used secularization and secularism as synonyms. And then he said everyone there wrote him off after that point, even though that was <laughs> basically made no difference regarding the point of needing the gospel. He uh, he wasn't heard. But that just goes to show his heart, that he wasn't there just trying to make an academic argument or a philosophical argument, but he was legitimately concerned about the souls of the people there who yeah. had no concern for the need of Christ's life, death, and resurrection and how that was the fundamental need for people, um, yeah, that, that they need Jesus. So that's a, question that a book every... like this, uh, like Ferguson's for Van Til would be worthwhile. But yeah. Dr. Ferguson, having the wonderful blend between scholarship and pastoral ministry, certainly I'm, I'm, I'm delighted that this book exists to highlight uh, that connection, that we don't fall into the, the trap of thinking that Dr. Ferguson is just a scholar with no practical import or application right i i think dr ferguson and and uh understands that every pastor needs to answer the question what what just as you put it camden what what do people really need and if we're not feeding them the very word of god and the and the and the theology of the word of god and the christ of the word of god ultimately then we're not feeding them any lasting food so I, I hope to just bend our way back to this particular book. Yes, I sir. hope that this is helpful in working out the theology of Scripture for the sake of feeding the flock of God.
you remark on page uh, two, it is, of the book. We're working with the PDF here, that these new copies of the book will be coming out shortly. But you remark, no aspect of the doctrine of Scripture is more basic for understanding what the Bible is than its inspiration. So you and I know that, you know, where we went to seminary had its struggles on the doctrine of inspiration. Some of those were cleaned up and they were, the seminary was in a different place when you arrived on campus for your PhD. When I arrived on campus for my MDiv, it was in great turmoil with uh, Dr. Enns teaching in Old Testament. I had him for two classes. I really love the guy, but don't agree with his doctrine of scripture much at all. But um, we're, you know, in the, in the, 2007 to 2011, especially in the at least Westminster circles, there was it was highly contentious. And um, thankfully, the, the an Orthodox confessional doctrine of Scripture, I think, has carried the day as it ought to. But in a day really that still con- that 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 uh, inspiration continues to be a contested issue. I mean, why do you contest this so strongly uh, at this point? Why is inspiration um, so significant, perhaps the most critical thing that we could give our attention to regarding the doctrine of Scripture? And if that's true, how come it's so contested among so many people, even in conservative circles? Yeah, well, great question. I think the reason that I wanted to make that point at the beginning is that it's true. (laughs) <laughs> well, that okay. I think that 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 if we're to understand what the Bible is, yeah. it's imperative that we understand the nature of its origin and authority as the very written word of God. And it's the doctrine of inspiration that tells us, how did this Bible come to be? Of course, there's a lot to say about its redemptive historical background of the acts and deeds of God in history. But when it comes to the actual production of the text of Scripture— Mm -hmm. As holy men were carried along by the Holy Spirit, as Peter puts it, we have to understand the nature and fact of organic inspiration. As to why it's contended, it's it's a point of conflict today, I think one dimension of that has to be, at least historically, the influence of Karl Barth and his emphasis on Christ. Uh, being the primary doctrine through which we see all else. And, and, and he believes that inspiration fixes too much uh, divine authority and activity in the very text of the Bible. But right. of course, that's exactly what we want to do. Mm. Not to deny that the Holy Spirit is not living and active, not to deny that the scriptures lift our eyes to the Christ of history, the Christ of heaven. But if we don't have inspiration, if, if, if the Holy Spirit is not the primary author of Scripture, then what are we doing uh, with the Bible? We, we, we're, we're playing in a sandbox with, with, with human words that may be high sounding and may be uh, inspiring the way that uh, a symphony can be inspiring to our souls. But we, if we're to be preaching and teaching the very word of God, we must understand that this is a word that comes from the very mouth of God, uh, mediated by by men, to be sure, but men who were who were providentially guided to write the very words of God, the living and active word of mm-hmm. God. So, um, yeah, contemporary theologians, I think John Webster would fall into this camp, would say uh, that we put too much epistemological weight on inspiration uh, when it should be on some broader notion of revelation or, yeah. or even the person work of Christ. But the way we have access to the special history of, of God's accomplishment of redemption is through the scriptures. And the reason we can trust the scriptures is because they are from God and the way they come from God is, is by the operation of the Holy spirit uh, in his work of inspiration. Mm-hmm. Um, can you explain more of what the doctrine of inspiration is, but I'm also very interested, and you, you treat this in the chapter, of what it is not. When, when you're speaking of um, the confessional, and I'm, I'm thinking primarily of the Westminster Confession of Faith and catechisms, uh, but also just the broader Reformed Orthodox tradition, 
for in brief, what is yeah. the doctrine of inspiration regarding Scripture, and and what is it not? Uh, how do we make sure okay. that we don't make the mistake of thinking that it's something other than what it actually is? Yeah. Well, the text that I go to here at the beginning of the essay is Second Timothy three sixteen. Familiar words: all Scripture, pasagraphe, all Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Okay, that, that initial clause, all scripture is breathed out by God. Uh, the Greek word there used only one time in the New Testament is theopneustos, and I think Warfield still has the definitive uh, scholarly explanation of what this verbal adjective is. It does not mean that the text is um, simply inspiring. Uh, it, it means that it is the product of God's sovereign mouth, so to speak. It is breathed out by God. In fact, the word inspired might yeah. be better right. said to be the scriptures are expired, right. you know, uh, breathed out by God right. as the very written word of God. They are the product of his creative breath, and they bear as the word of God, the very authority of God. Mm. So what do we mean by inspiration? We mean that men wrote the very word of God uh, according to the dictates and sovereign work uh, of the Holy Spirit. And, and, that, and, and as far as what it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean that, that, the, that the Holy Spirit commandeered all of the faculties of men and made them robots. Uh, it doesn't mean mere dictation, although as Voss points out, there are portions in the scriptures that sure. come close to what we mean by dictation. Sure. Um, but, but as Warfield, I think, puts it in one of his essays on inspiration, that the spirit employed the, the untra he has a phrase like the untrammeled play of all of the human writers faculties, something mm -hmm. like that. I just remember the untrammeled play, yeah. uh, the Holy spirit worked in and through the personalities, the makeup, um, the gift set of the human writers of scripture. And yet such a way in such a way that, that what they wrote was the very word of God. It Absolutely. didn't have the potential to spur the word of God in our hearts or to bring about an encounter with the word of God. It is, in fact, the very word of God written. Mm -hmm. Objectively. Um, yeah. But also has that great effect within us as the spirit continues to work in and through it to, to change uh, particularly his, his elect, but also condemn those who would reject it. Um, that's, that's so significant. We need not uh, underestimate the significance of that doctrine and um, its import uh, for our lives. As you mentioned Warfield a few times, I'm going to give you a uh, going to be a little pugnacious, but just for the sake of conversation, because you know we're on the same page here, but did Warfield, or at least Old Princeton, just invent that doctrine? Um, I don't think so. Okay. Uh, I thought Briggs said that he invented it. Was it Briggs? Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, m m m many people. I mean, in... Uh, uh, McKim uh, and uh, the Mc, uh, Rogers McKim Rogers proposal. McKim volume I think makes that contention as well if I'm not mistaken but that's one contention that the doctrine that we have now wasn't that way in the yeah. 18th maybe even 19th century but it came to I be through the work of old Princeton and whatnot to turn it into a new orthodoxy but um, you know historical study disproves that contention that contended point you're taking me back a number of years, sure. but I, I remember before heading up to Philadelphia, I read John Woodbridge's Biblical Authority, I think it's called, and I just remember he, him absolutely dismantling the Rogers McKim proposal. Mm -hmm. It was the first work, I think, that I read where, where I just saw a scholarly thesis get absolutely shredded. Eviscerated. And mm. what... Woodbridge does is he just goes back to the church fathers and the reformers and and walks through their understanding of what the Bible is and um, 
yeah, it, it was just devastating. So I would encourage people to read that that work to get a more historical take on inspiration and biblical authority. And I remember years ago hearing R.C. Sproul say in his gravelly tone, yes, Martin Luther never used the word inerrant to describe the product of inspiration and as a feature of the biblical text. But he did say that the Bible is without error. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes we can get we can get hung up on sure you know like especially over the 20th century battles over inerrancy and the battle for the bible in the 1970s and sometimes you hear british evangelicals say well this is just not this is an american debate it's not a british debate but um leave aside those link those those particular battles in America and, and what does inerrancy mean? I, I think inerrancy, I mean, inspiration has a historical pedigree going back to the- I do beginning. too. And it needs to start there. Uh, but but a, a proper notion of, of inspiration will, will lead to, I believe, better and proper understandings of inerrancy and infallibility, authority, necessity, perspicuity, all these attributes of scripture- yeah. Um, so, so to go to answer to go back on your question about what does it not mean? I think in light of recent history, we should say inspiration does not mean that God merely spoke in the idioms of the day and accommodated himself to the errors of ancient Near Eastern cultures in in so doing, such that out of the ashes of human error, his truth somehow arises like a phoenix no mm. inspiration means that the holy spirit sovereign over the workings of men led holy men mm -hmm. used holy men not sinless men fallible men to write precisely the very word of god written and that he is was... still living and active sharper than a two-edged sword so that right. inerrancy and infallibility and absolute authority are fixed features of the text as text. Absolutely. And the Lord was supernaturally and sovereignly at work as an agent, as the primary author of these texts, yet using the individual faculties and characteristics of each author, yet doing so without overcoming those, but carrying them along as wind in the sails, as Peter might say. Uh, mm -hmm. to write the very words of God so that the product is the, the exact same in terms of authority and inerrancy um, as if it was dictated uh, or just dropped out of heaven. But yet God used uh, these, these human authors to, to carry them along to produce this. So another form of inspiration might be God looked down and he curated the best of human writings he collected them together. He realized that they rise to the standard and, and just thankfully these particular works don't have any errors in them or they accomplish the purpose that the Lord would want. He put them together and maybe he even breathed in his spirit into that collection. Mm -hmm. Like he breathed life into uh, dust, a collection of dirt uh, to make man. He also made his word that way. That's a more simplistic kind of adoptionistic view of scripture that is not at all what is meant by this uh by by the conf what the confession says or what the bible says about the very word of god um but more so not only was god an agent and the primary author of these things but the, the characteristics of scripture are direct consequences functions of the attributes of god himself and this is a point that Van Til makes. You allude to this a bit, I think, on page nine, when you start when you reference Van Til uh, talking about Scripture's authority and sufficiency. If Scripture is God's very word, and it is, the autographs, then certainly we can say many things about God's word. God can't lie, for example. So. There's that. <laughs> there aren't going to be any errors. God is omniscient. He's he's uh, not going to make any errors. He is all powerful and sovereign. So his word will always accomplish what he sends it out to do. Isaiah fifty five ten, if I'm not mistaken, his word does not return void or empty. So there's all sorts of things that you can say about the word because of who speaks it. 
And that has a lot to do with how this impacts our daily life, doesn't it? It does. It's, it's fascinating to think about the connections between the character of God and the character of scripture. Um, they're not one and the same, but because the scriptures are the very word of God written, they reflect and bear within themselves uh, some, of, some of the features of, of God, absolute authority, searching power, um, spirit-wrought effectiveness in the hearts of men. Sometimes I think Christians on, you know, in weaker moments say, I wish I could have been there at Mount Sinai, you know, when the Lord thundered right. and, and spoke to the nation. I wish I could have heard Jesus speaking on the road in, in the Israel, maze. in oh, yeah. ancient Palestine. Yeah. And, and we forget that if the Bible is the very word of God, then it comes to us with the same glory and power and authority as each of those moments. Uh, we have the very word of God and, and Voss I think in his writings, uh, his essay on Hebrews, speaks of the scriptures as, as fresh as for us in our generation, as, as fresh a spring of the Lord's voice uh, in the very words of scripture as when it was first written. And so we confess that, that we're, we're hearing um, the, the voice of Christ uh, speaking in the scriptures. It is the spirit who speaks in the very words of scripture uh, that's coming to us every time we open our Bibles and, and derivatively every time we hear the word preached. So we should never think that we're getting some sort of dumbed down second tier version mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. the word of God. Uh, we, we are handling and proclaiming uh the authoritative word of the living God. And that word is itself says living and active. Um, the Holy spirit is speaking today in the very words of scripture to our souls. And, and this is the, this is the way God is sustaining and carrying his church uh, to, to her heavenly home through this Bible. Mm -hmm. We've spoken a bit about accommodation at least it's come up. We haven't really do, dove down deep into it. But what is meant by the accommodation of Scripture? Because that, I think, also reveals something of the character of our God and also the purpose uh, for which he spoke to us and gave us this word. Yeah, I in writing this essay, I tried to find a way that I could address all of the key attributes of Scripture but, but get to them through a, a broader framework. And so my main three points are that scripture is inspired by God, it's accommodated to us, and it has a redemptive historical design. And people who read the essay will see that on the first point, inspiration, I try to lead into, therefore, it's authority and sufficiency. And under accommodation, I try to get into Oh, what is it? It's clarity and necessity. And then it's redemptive historical design. I try to get into scripture's finality and effectiveness. Uh, but speaking on that second point, uh, scripture's accommodated character, what, I, what I'm trying to get across here, I think, is that, yes, the Bible comes to us with the very authority of God, but as it comes to us, God speaks in a way that is eminently suited to us, first as creatures made in his image, and second as creatures made in his image who are fallen. And I think it's important to keep those distinct. Uh, first, God must speak to us in a way we can understand simply because we're finite creatures. We're not God. And so to borrow from Calvin, he stoops and he lisps to us. Now, Leave aside the fact that when Calvin said God lisps to us, he's talking about anthropomorphic language, which is another conversation. Yeah, but more sure. broadly, God himself speaks to us in a way that we can understand. And he uses anthropomorphic language uh, to do that uh, through and through uh, the scriptures. But we need God to remember 
um, to remember that we can't handle a full revelation of his glory were he to burst it in revelation before our eyes. We would be consumed by him. And it would be overwhelming to us simply as creatures. Uh, and, and so God accommodates himself in his revelation. He, he reveals to us dimensions of his glory over time. Um, and then the fact that we're fallen, uh, God accommodates himself to our need by not only giving us a revelation of his glory, but doing it in a redemptive way a way spurred by his, his love for his people and, and his sovereign intention to bring them out of that estate of sin and misery mm -hmm. into unbreakable fellowship with himself. So, yeah, in the second section on accommodated character of scripture, I try to get at both of those. And, sure. then, and then since God has spoken in a way we can understand what, what are the blessings of that for pastoral ministry, that we have a word here that is accessible, that is understandable, that is sufficiently clear and that is necessary for the church uh, to grow in grace and to be right. built up in Christ. You start to turn that corner on page 12. You, all of this has been practically oriented. Uh, none of it is um, just thrown in as some sort of uh, academic exercise. But on page 12, at least, you start to speak more pointedly, I believe, about the necessity, sufficiency, and authority of Scripture and how they do apply to pastoral ministry. What, what have you found in pastoral ministry? You served as a pastor before going off to study uh, for your PhD. Now you're back in pastoral ministry after teaching in the seminary for a while, and you're still teaching in the seminary, but predominantly in pastoral ministry. I've been in pastoral ministry doing what I do now, but it, it, it is you lose sight of this, that uh, these have everything to do with one another. The doctrine of Scripture is not just something you study so that you can read your Bible well, so that you can then preach to people. But the actual doctrine itself is so significant. When we understand what the Word is and what God does in and through it, I think it it enables us or it, tra it transforms how we approach the very activities of pastoral ministry in the first place. I mean, would you agree with that? And if so, what are some examples or some ways that you've seen those connections work out in your own ministry? Well, I there are a number of things that could be said. I've heard you, Camden, in years past, talk about the blessing of, of being a pastor who preaches week to week and the benefit yeah. of studying the Word of God, first for our own soul, which right. has to be, I think, the first step. The, the, the pastor himself must be affected and transformed by the Scriptures as he is communing with the living Christ, as he is repenting of sin, as he is fighting for holiness. And out of the overflow of a pastor's heart, uh, he steps in and he preaches the word that he has studied. He teaches, he counsels, he prays. Uh, the word and the spirit working by and with the word as we are united to Christ is the heart and soul of pastoral ministry. And I think personally, you know, moving back into pastoral ministry in these last two years, that has just been a tremendous blessing for me to be able to study the word in all of its breadth and dive in to the text of the Old and New Testaments for the sake of, of first feeding my own soul, but with a view toward, toward building up the people of God. Uh, it's, just been a, it's just been a wonderful, refreshing, uh, almost unexpected blessing. And I remember talking to the senior pastor here at Westminster, Aaron Messner, and we were talking about what a gift it is. I mean, don't get me wrong. We, we've got nitty gritty trials here. Uh, you know, we, it's, it, there's a persevering dimension, of course, but we were talking about the blessing of studying the word each week. And he said, we're like, we're like Moses's mother. And I was, I was thinking, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, Moses's mother sent him out in that little ark, right? Uh, and yet Pharaoh's daughter, through, through God's providence, uh, had, had the, the young girl, her daughter, uh, come and find Moses's mother to nurse him when he was a child. So she had the great blessing of sending him out, but also 
having the privilege of holding mm-hmm. him near at the same time. And, and that's what pastors get to do. Mm. Uh, we, we get to send the word out, but, but we're the ones who are actually being blessed by the word uh, first <laughs> and perhaps last as we, as we get to um, spend time with the Lord in his word through preparation. Yeah. I think there's also, that's absolutely true. That's something I miss is preaching every week and, and uh, exegeting passages, preaching Lectio Continua. It has an effect upon you, uh, a wonderful benefit. It's a tremendous privilege. I love what I do now, but I mean, that's, that's probably the biggest thing I miss is preaching more regularly. Um, but I think even at a, at a more basic level, if we, if we truly believe what Scripture is, we do, that it's powerful. Like mm-hmm. Sometimes you just need to be reminded that Scripture changes people. Like the mm-hmm. Bible is a means of grace. And I yep. truly believe that. And you see it at work. And sometimes you come to your wit's end or when you're, you know, according to the flesh, we rely on ourselves or our own methods or we wonder how are we going to get through to these people or you're dealing mm-hmm. with a particular counseling case that just you cannot fathom how this is ever going to work out or what to do. You just don't know and mm-hmm. and have no ideas, no hope, you know, but yet when we truly believe in the power of God and in his word and his means of grace and the activity of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we rest and rely upon the authority, sufficiency, the, the efficacy of scripture and minister that word. So we don't mm-hmm. rely on ourselves to convince and convert people or to change people. But we trust in God to do it, the Holy Spirit to do it, and his principal means of doing that is through the ministry of the word. And that, that's life-changing. And if you're going into pastoral ministry and you don't have that fundamental conviction, or if it's not strong conviction, you need to remember these things. You need to learn these things and then constantly rest and rely upon them. That's what enables our ministry. We need to become less so that Christ will be exalted. <laughs> And Amen, it, brother. Yeah, so Amen. That, that's like a big, I don't know, that's a big point for me. <laughs> oh, man. What a great, absolutely. Okay. And when you, when you, when you pray for that, when you pursue that in the, in the context of the church, you know, with God's blessing, that orientation will get into the DNA of the people and they will begin to love the word uh, more, more than they love the preacher. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, that's a good thing. Mm-hmm. And and they will they will begin to to love the word in such a way that they recognize that Christ is the is the leader and shepherd of the church, mm-hmm. uh, not ultimately the preacher, the pastor. And 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 every activity in the church will be oriented to the word, whether you're whether you're training up covenant children or doing VBS or you know women's Bible studies or um, you know, when the young men get together and try to encourage one another on Tuesday nights or, or when we have Wednesday night gathering at the church, it's, it's all being to talk about counseling and, and Christian fellowship. All these things are happening at our church, and it's all driven by the reality that we center our lives on the scriptures, mm-hmm. not because we're bibliolatrists or you right. know, we're worshiping Worship the Bible. Following the paper pope as, yeah. the, as the Catholics <laughs> Would call but us because Protestants. the Holy Spirit has appointed means right. of of communion with the triune God and with exalting Christ and saving people and and cleansing us of our sins through the blood of Christ. It's through the gospel that is revealed in the pages of Scripture, and and if we're not trusting that, if we're not tr- if we're not modeling our, if we're not building a philosophy of ministry on that fact, then the church is going to be picking up some other kind of DNA that's not going to be healthy for the soul or mm-hmm. for the body of the, of the church. I'm all for having groups and people gathering to study, having events and or even organizing things around that. But, you know, a program centric ministry just for the sake of having programs is totally misguided. Um, if we are people of the word and devoted to the word, then that enables everything else, as you've said, rather than making our, our hope to be in some method, <laughs> mm-hmm. our hope, 
needs to be in the Lord and in his word to to lead us, to guide us, and to change us. His, his word's a lamp to our feet, a light for our path. If we don't have that, then what do we have? And if we, and if we think that the Bible is just a really great historical text, uh, or if we are approaching it as such that it's just stories about people that have gone before us that are good examples for us, then that doesn't enable a vibrant ministry either. And that's something that you start to get into when you're speaking about the redemptive historical character mm. of Scripture. It's possible people could have a high view of Scripture abstractly. They could have an orthodox doctrine of Scripture, but yet forget the redemptive historical character of it or how it has been progressively revealed to God's people throughout the ages. What are people missing if they miss that part? How are they impoverished as as Christians uh, or, or, or lacking something if they stop short of yeah. recognizing this redemptive historical character. So great. So great. I think, um, yeah, we, we can have a high view of the Bible and end up thinking, okay, if I just memorize the Bible, if I talk about the Bible, if I think about the Bible, then that's really, that's really the end game here. And it, it's, it's not the end game. The end game is, is union and communion with Christ being transformed into his image so that uh, we might we might delight in God as our blessedness and reward so that God's glory might might shine in all of its magnificence in the presence of many Christ formed mm -hmm. brothers and sisters on the last day but, yeah but 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 if we were to like if that's looking forward let's look backwards and let's see that the bible is what it is because of what god has said and done in history and and it is through his redemptive words and deeds uh, climaxing in christ and as christ has commissioned particular people to testify to his person and work it's through that crucible of history that the bible has come to us and and it is that that revelatory record of that Christ-centered history that presents the person of Jesus to us in, 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 in his death, resurrection, ascension. Um, and so if we don't have the redemptive historical character of scripture, we're going to miss the Christ-centered character of the Bible. We're going to miss the way in which uh, God has deigned to present Christ to us and for the preacher. And here we're getting into hermeneutics. We're not going to be able to, we're not going to be preaching the Bible in all of its Christ centered glory. If we don't recognize the history that stands behind it and that led up to it. So in some ways, this was the most uh, enjoyable. Uh, I think for me, uh, invigorating section to write because it forced forced me to think through. Okay, what are the pastoral implications yes, of the yes. redemptive historical character of the Bible? Mm -hmm. And it was just glorious to see. Well, well, the redemptive historical character of Scripture explains why the Bible is really enough uh, because it climaxes with the personal coming of Christ in history and with the definitive interpretation and attestation of that work through the apostles and the New Testament writers, so we don't need anymore. The redemptive historical character of the Bible tells us that the Bible is not a fortune cookie that speaks to every little circumstance of my life, like whether I should take this job or that, but it points me to the Christ under whose lordship I need to be making all the decisions for my life. Uh, and it tells me how to preach the Bible. If I'm in the Old Testament, I'm looking to see how does this fit into the grand scheme of the unfolding covenant of grace? How does it lead up to Christ? How, does, how is the power of Christ being revealed in history uh, to, the, to the first audience of this text and to the, to the events that it describes? Um, how did the different genres of the Bible fit together as a, as a, as a multifaceted testimony to the glory of Christ? And, uh, and, and, and its effectiveness, you know, what is God doing today through the Bible as we are, as we are that waiting church, as first Thessalonians puts it, waiting for his son from heaven, who delivers us from the wrath to come. We are living uh, between 
uh, the first coming of Christ in weakness and unto glory, and we are waiting for the consummation. And this too has massive pastoral implications uh, for the church today, as we as we're a pilgrim people who don't live in a theocracy, as Israel of old, as people who are bearing the cross, manifesting uh, the power of Christ in weakness, looking to our heavenly reward. All of these riches that we talk about all the time, uh, that you and Lane walk through, uh, this is this is all a a, a a downstream from the redemptive historical foundations and character of uh, the scriptures that we preach. Yeah, it truly is. I love that, the the point, that the redemptive historical character drives us to our relationship with God, namely through Jesus Christ. And what's the whole point of everything? The whole point of predestination in the first place, as you've alluded to, is Romans 8, 29, is so that we would you know, Christ came and the purpose of predestination is that all things should be glorified and through him, he would be glorified, but that he would become the firstborn of many brothers. So the point of our salvation, the point of our calling even, is so that God would build and establish and build and cultivate a relationship with his people and make us more like Jesus and he's been speaking to his people and encouraging them and instructing them all along the way, starting in the garden, leading all the way through the wilderness, into the promised land, into exile, out of exile, you know, through these difficult periods under persecution and tyranny, and then finding true and ultimate lasting liberation through the death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ. We have a record of God's speech to his people throughout the ages, which has an effect and applicability to us. And he continues to speak to us in and through this word. I think it's so critical. I think that, you know, every every, uh, doctrine of scripture text or every section of any future ST ought to have a section on the redemptive historical character of scripture. Because I think so often we read these we read the typical headings, right? And you probably reviewed many of them when you're looking to prepare for this chapter, but very few um, will mention anything, uh, if at all, about this progressive revelation. And not just the fact that that's an aspect of the text, but why it's there. That this is a record and a demonstration of God's love and care for his people. And that, that's the whole point. I mean, that's, that's why God saves us in the first place. So that, I think, is perhaps the most encouraging and uh, should be the most um, strengthening or uplifting aspect of this whole conversation. How does theology impact ministry? How does the doctrine of Scripture influence our daily life? Well, we have a Bible that is a testimony to and an ongoing uh, benefit, an ongoing gift, um, and testimony to God's relationship to us and the growth of that and the leading of us unto the day when Christ would return. So well done on that front, Carlton. I appreciate that. Thank you, brother. <laughs> may, may I make just one final point on that? Please do. I'll just tell you one of the most precious things I think I, I really discovered in writing this is when I was reading a bit of Voss in the early pages of his shorter writings, and he's talking about how the redemptive historical character of redemption, uh, of revelation, is, is, is owing to the redemptive historical character of redemption. In other words, the word of God tracks with and testifies to the work of God yeah, word in indeed. history. Mm-hmm. And so as God's works unfold through the course of history across the generations leading to Christ, so too his word that accompanied that in every lockstep movement of history comes to us in a historical form. But then on a particular page, and I have a footnote here, maybe I could read, but Voss gets one level deeper and he asks this question, why does the work of redemption proceed historically? And he, he says, essentially, that it's because 
the unfolding of the human race unfolds historically. And so I just found that to be so wonderful to think about that, that God has accommodated, to go back to the notion of accommodation, God has accommodated the nature of our redemption to our historical identity as his creatures. Yeah. And he has added to that redemption uh, a revelatory word that explains it and presents it to us and all of its all of its significance and meaning. And so here, here, here's the quote that I included in footnote. Well, in this version that I printed out, it's footnote 41. Mm-hmm. Voss says, um, this is in his, his uh, you know, his address, the idea of biblical theology as a science and as a theological discipline. He says, as soon as we realize that revelation is at almost every point interwoven with and conditioned by the redeeming activity of God in its wider sense, and together with the latter, connected with the natural development of the present world, its historical character becomes perfectly intelligible and ceases to cause surprise. So what does this tell us about our God? It tells us that God knows who we are. He knows what we need. And he has introduced organically into the fabric of history a redemptive plan that culminates with the Christ who was born out of the womb of history from heaven, but through the very means and mechanisms of history, and who brought into the very fabric of history the very power of heaven. And he's given us a word that is infallible and sufficient and effectual for our lives that itself arises out of that history to meet us in the present uh, who are creatures of history awaiting the consummation of history. And this mm. makes everything so much more concrete. You know, as Voss says, this, the, uh, what does he say? The circle of truth is not a school, but a covenant. Uh, the <laughs> right, Lord right, comes right. near, something like that. He comes near to us and he blesses us with a covenantal word and a Christ who took our flesh and who will come again. And, and it's all organically presented in the Bible and it fits organically with the needs of our own heart. And, and, and therein, I think, is wonderful power for pastoral ministry, wonderful confidence for the, for the one who, who's driven by scripture in, in fulfilling the calling of ministry. Amen. Amen. I love it. I love this chapter. I love this book. It's great. And uh, thank you for, for taking the time to write this chapter, but also to speak with me and share this with all of our listeners. Uh, this is this is wonderful. We'll have copies soon, soon. So hopefully uh, you can put in your pre-order now. Um, and uh, we've got copies, uh, not a lot of them, but uh, we are offering them for 25% off. So you can get a copy for $29.99 over at reformedforum.org slash store. While you're there, pick up all sorts of interesting goodies. And uh, subscribe to our email newsletter because we have a lot coming out soon. Um, we got our confer- our fall conference registration, which is going to be um, open really soon, October 1st. And the, then the pre-conference is September 30th. We also have... Um, possibly new reading groups coming out and Lane Tipton's book, Van Til's Trinitarian Theology, which is I think on its way. I mean, they were the, the pub, the printer where the publisher, the printer said that they were, I think finishing their print one run yesterday. And I have to wire uh, some final funds just to get that thing shipped out and sent over here. So that's a hardcover. We're going to have a fun deluxe kit for the, you know, 100 sets of some interesting things. We'll have news on all that in the email newsletter. So if you're interested in these sorts of things and you're not already subscribed and receiving our emails, please do so soon so that you get all this news uh, quickly. You can figure that out and subscribe over at reformedforum.org slash newsletter. I want to thank everybody for listening and and watching. Um, This is just a joy. And thank you, Carlton, for taking the time today. we got to get you on more often and let's work on that Van Sill group soon. Thanks so much, brother. All right. Well, thanks everyone for for listening. We hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center.